praise the Lord, you reach Pastor Priscilla Harlan. Let us go to the throne of grace. Eternal Heavenly Father, once again, we honor you. We worship you. We exalt you for your holiness and your righteousness that exalts a nation. But disobedience, rebellion, dishonesty, deception, disillusion is a reproach to any people. Father, we thank you for your godly wisdom that stands. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that convicts and instructs and reveals. And drawing close to your altar so that we can remain a habitation unto you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for being the head that follows you. That you are the great shepherd. You are the great bishop. You are the great I am. You satisfy to the utmost. You're the great teacher, the great proclaimer of the word of truth. You're the great intercessor, the one who's able to do exceedingly above what we could ever ask or think of according to the power that worketh within these earthly vessels, your excellence. And so we honor you, Father, in the greatest sincerity of who you are. We ask your heavenly Father to keep our high praise unto you in our mouth, rejoicing, and your goodness, your greatness, your excellency, giving thanks always because you're there, working it out, binding, asking, destroying, transforming, revealing, discerning, a two-edged sword that you uphold and that you give the wisdom and knowledge how to operate with it. You divide through your judgment and your justice and give us the wisdom to know what's acceptable and unacceptable in your sight. Oh, Father, we honor you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. 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 It's something about honoring and trusting in a holy and righteous God, even when you're just being obedient. Still good. Night is wonderful.
Just have to say it one more time. this part. Amen. I've never played that song, nor sang. So I really wasn't familiar with it, but when you think about it, he is the great shepherd. He is the God of all. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. That is something that you can meditate on. 
He's the rock of all ages. And we should bow down before him, love and adore him. His name is wonderful, Jesus. Amen. 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 I'm going to be coming from Daniel 9 9, and it reads as thus Through the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness though we have rebelled against him. Let me give you a background of the writing. The biblical account of Daniel is found in, in the Bible, in the Old. Daniel was a young Jewish noble taken into captivity by the Babylonians during the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. Around 605 BC, after the fall of Jerusalem, the writing can be divided into two main sections. Narrative history, chapters one through six, and the prophetic visions, chapters seven through 12. Daniel lets us know that God gives us history for our remembrance, history for our learning, history for our admonition and warning. No, he also gives us prophecy, prophetic visions to assure you that he is truly omniscient. He gives futuristic knowledge, futuristic revelations, understanding, and wisdom in politics. Daniel's training was in Babylon. We find that in Daniel 1. Daniel was with his three companions, Haniah, Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. They were chosen to serve in King Nebuchadnezzar's palace because of their intelligence and appearance. Sometimes the adversary will choose you to serve in his palace because of your appearance and your intelligence. Your ability to skillfully handle the word of God and your ability to have a praise unto God that he wants you to change, to manipulate, to deceive others into worshiping and dishonoring the holy and righteous God. You see, they were trained and King Nebuchadnezzar knew that. He was looking for trained people that he could use to train his people in his way. He didn't want Daniel to train according to the ways of God. It was his desire to take Daniel's skills, Daniel's gift that God had given him and to use it to dishonor God, to honor the adversary, to honor the ways of the world, to honor him. They knew the language and literature of Babylon, but they refused to defile themselves with the king's food, choosing a diet of vegetables and water. That was a fast that God was calling them on because many times kings would have a banquet to show those in attendees his next staff that he has hired to operate on his behalf. His banquet would determine who he receives. And only those that were received by the king that could come to his banquet was quite often thought as being important. And they would have only been important because Daniel, Shedrach and Amidago, 
Azariah, they had their Jewish name that was changed to Babylon name, was because they wanted to have them to operate and contrary to the ways of God. They were able to learn the language and literature of Babylon. So it showed they had a skillful ability that God had given them to be able to learn other disciplines. And it's in the learning of other disciplines they could be utilized to control the mind. That's why the Bible says we are to be the head and not the tail. The head is a part of the God that seeks the mind of Christ, that operates under the wisdom of God, that operates under the counsel of God, and abide in the ways and thoughts of God. The diet was a fasting that they understood this was spiritual warfare and that they needed to be focused, dedicated into not succumbing to Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, wicked desires to have their skillful abilities that God gave them to use in a way, manipulate others for his king. We can see that today. Some people can have godly skillful abilities that resonates a drawing. There's an anointing on their abilities. There's anointing on how they can proclaim the gospel, how they can minister through worship, how they can just daily minister to those, that their lives will begin to desire to be changed because of the impartation they're receiving through the spirit of truth to reveal the necessity that God transforms and the needfulness to humble themselves before a holy and righteous God. They can see the anointing of the sincerity and how many will gravitate to the sincerity because they really want to know God, really want to be drawn by God, really want to live a different life. And sometimes those who are not sincere, those who have other personal agenda will draw to their anointing to try to get them to preach their gospel, their acceptance, their standards, their will, and manipulate and mishandle the two ends rule. To get praises of them to flow from their mouth and not the praises of God. Because if I be lifted up, the Lord Jesus said, I will draw. And sometimes these kings want to be lifted up so that you would be drawn to them. And they decided they were not going to abide by all that King Nebuchadnezzar was doing. He was giving them the best of everything because he had a personal agenda, a personal motive. And so he was drawing them in by the desires that he thought their flesh would want to partake, that he thought their flesh would embrace so that he could manipulate those to follow him, King Nebuchadnezzar. God bless the three Hebrew decisions and they became healthier and wiser than their peers. 
Some things only come out with fasting and praying. And God calls the fast when he knows it's needful. You see, fasting is not about losing weight. Fasting is not about stress. Fasting is not about our decision. Fasting is about God's decision to call you on a fast to draw closer to him so that you can become more sensitive to what's going on in your environment. So you can be more sensitive to the spiritual warfare that's coming up against you. So that you will be strengthening your inner person to be able to endure what comes up against you. Fasting can keep you from some situations. Fastings can destroy strongholds and entanglement. Fasting can give you revelation. Fasting can help you hear better from God. Fasting can give you the ability to operate in any area in your life when God calls it. And he determines what you're fasting from. Now you can operate so fasting. But there are periods when God will call you on a fast. He called the Israelites on a fast when they were in the wilderness, but they didn't know it was a fast. He changed their diet. What they wanted, he didn't get. He gave what they needed to strengthen them. But they wanted what they were accustomed to. And God was changing their diet to get their attention. To be able to hear from him. To be able to see the movement of God in their life. There are times when God calls a faith. We don't call our own faith. We don't determine. Wake up one morning and say, I'm on a faith. God calls the faith. You wake up one morning and find out you were on a fast three or four days and didn't realize. You weren't depressed. You weren't stressed. You weren't confused. He just called you on the face. And whatever you should have been going through, you didn't go through it because you obeyed God. And didn't even know it was necessary that he do that for you. And Daniel too, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and Daniel interpreted it. God gave Daniel a gift of interpretation of dreams that no king's wise men could interpret the dream. When God is operating in your life, you will have a certain ability that others won't have. God knew Daniel would be taken into captivity. God knew Daniel would follow him. God knew Daniel would be given an opportunity to interpret a dream that no other kingsman would be able to do. And that would put Daniel in a different position of favor with the king. There are times when God will have you to move and places that are not honoring him and places that are not sincere with the things of God and places that are not established in the ways of God. And God will give you a special ability to know things, to discern things, to interpret certain things and to operate in certain abilities 
that the king will notice, that the king will come to you and notice your special ability. It is to show the king who your God is. It is to reveal to the king his God's mercy and grace over the king's life that you serve our holy and righteous God. After Daniel was interpreted the dream, Daniel was promoted. God can use your skills to promote you even in places that don't honor God. Because your skills has his integrity, has his character, has his excellency and abilities that are noticed by those who don't even know God. And you get promoted by those who don't even know your God. Daniel was promoted to a high position in the kingdom. Daniel in chapter 3 was put in a fiery furnace after his promotion. The fast that Daniel went on was to be prepared of things to come that Daniel didn't know would come, but God knew. There are times God prepares the believer by calling them on a fast to prepare them for what is about to come that you otherwise would not be able to handle. That's why it's important to obey God when he calls it. That's why it's so important to obey God when he orchestrates it. The Bible says there's a time and place for everything. Daniel found himself Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Seeing what Nebuchadnezzar's real objective was for them. Nebuchadnezzar built a massive golden statue and demanded everyone to worship it. They refuse. There are times you're going to find yourself in a place that you're going to have to refuse some ways that are not admirable to God. This is the testing of your faith. This is where God showed you your ability to withstand human influence, no matter what powers they may have, they refuse. Do you know if you refuse a king back then, they could cut your head off, decapitate you and just throw you away? They had control over your life, a king. No one ever refused the king for fear. You didn't refuse their banquets. You didn't refuse their laws of the land. And you didn't refuse anything they asked of you. They had the power over your life. Here Daniel is asked with his friends to worship a golden statue. And they refuse the king's order. We are to refuse any orders that are contrary to God's God. Worshiping a golden statue is ungodly. Thou shalt worship no other God than our than God. Here, Daniel is being tested about worship. 
the same similar testing that Satan did to Jesus while he was on a fast in the wilderness for 40 days. You're going to see the correlation shift. First, Daniel changes his diet. God is preparing him for the fiery furnace, deliverance. Jesus goes into the wilderness after being baptized by the Holy Spirit on a 40-day fast, and Satan tempts him about worship. There is nothing that we can be tempted with that God hasn't made a way out of. When you trust God and depend upon God. They refuse. The punishment for refusal was they were thrown in the fiery furnace. But God miraculously delivered them. They were seen walking unharmed in the fire with a fourth figure. Three went in. They saw four. The fourth figure was described as the son of God. God is omnipresent. Anywhere you find yourself, God is there when you need him. That was a test of Daniel and his friends to trust God beyond human sight and understanding. A fiery furnace was to get you to become fearful and obey the command to worship a massive coding statue. We are to love the Lord God with all our heart, mind, body, and soul. And if you truly love him, then when you are given a command that's contrary to God, that is disobedient to God, that dishonors God, you are never to follow and accept. God will fight your battle the same way God fought the three Hebrews' battles. They were thrown in a furnace. No one had ever been thrown in a furnace and came out alive. Sometimes we go through the fiery trials of life like a furnace. Designed to destroy you. The design to put ungodly fear in your life. Designed to make you bow before the adversary and worship. You have to trust God that if God be for you, who can be against you? God came in in the nick of time in Daniel 3.25 and they were unharmed by the fire. You'll never know what God is able to do for you except you trust him and allow him to show you what he can do. They would have never known that God can stop a fiery furnace from devouring, destroying their life had they not trusted God. We have to trust God with our very life to know he's able. Because powers that are undoubted will use their power to try to get you to bow to their God. To conform to their ways. Daniel was taken from his home to Babylon. 
He was taken from his job to Babylon. He was taken from his wealth to Babylon. And then he was called a name, a Babylonian name. Some people will call you ungodly names to try to identify you, to conform to their ways. But you have to hold on to what God calls you and stay faithful with his stand. Because anything that powers can take from you, God can give it back to you sevenfold. If you remain faithful to God. Yes, it can be difficult. Very difficult. But you're dealing with a God that will never forsake you. He'll never leave you. And powers of be will try to get you to forsake your God and leave your God. But wisdom from above tells you to endure and persevere. When Daniel and his friends were thrown as a punishment, anytime ungodly forces try to punish you because you won't conform to their ways, you have a God of divine judgment and retribution that you can put your faith in. He's dependent. Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged the power of God when he saw they did not die. The fire didn't kill them. It didn't harm them. They were protected. God will put a fortress around you to protect you. He's your covering. A covering that no power and principality can come up against and withstand. We have to stop being weak in our faith. We have to stop going by what we think. We can do and trust God. We have to stop depending on others to do what only God could do. Because Nebuchadnezzar, after Daniel and his friends learned the language, after Daniel and his friends learned the literature, after Daniel and his friends was trying to work this out with the king, because they didn't fully submit to the king's ways. They didn't fully conform to the king's ways. They threw them in a ferny, fiery furnace. People will change on you. They will come to you to make you think there could be some allegiance. But to have an allegiance, you got to give up your God. To have an allegiance, you have to lower your standards. To have an allegiance, you have to dishonor your God. And when you don't conform, when you don't lower your standards, when you don't dishonor your God, they will throw you in a fiery furnace to take your life. can know the heart of humanity for it is desperately wicked. Here this king had him at a banquet. Had him learning the language and the literature. Grooming him. Grooming them for a specific agenda. You have to be careful about being groomed to conform to this world. Because our God don't groom, our God transforms. 
and to holiness and righteousness and justice and wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Conformity is acceptance. Conformity is deception. Be careful. God is the spirit of truth. Be careful. They put Daniel on their clothing. The Babylonian clothing. They changed their names to conform them to Babylonian culture. Babylonian culture do not worship God. Be careful of the conformity that does not worship God. Ha la 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 la. Mm, 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 mm. Now let me give you a little bit of wisdom from behind this. Whatever colors they wore as Jews, they could have used the same colors to wear as Babylonian captivity. The garment would have just looked a little different because your power is not in your colors. Your power is in a spirit. The Holy Spirit that cannot be transformed, changed, modified by humanity. You better put your faith and trust in something deeper than what can be done in the flesh. You see, changing his name was to demoralize him. People will call you out of your name to demoralize you, to humiliate you, to have control over you, to make you a servant. But we're called to be a head, not a servant, only a servant to the head, Jesus Christ. Mm, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory, hallelujah. And damn you for. Nebuchadnezzar had another dream, which Daniel had to interpret as a warning to the king's downfall because of his pride. God will bring your enemy a base. When you trust God, honor God, and stay committed to him, anybody comes up against you to make you conform out of the will of God when you trust God. Lean not towards your own understanding. Let him guide you skillfully with his hands. Be careful of others' hands. God will humble your enemy. After King Nebuchadnezzar tried to kill Daniel and his friend, God saved his, their life. He had to go to them again for a dream that he could not interpret. And Daniel told him about the destruction that God was going to do to him. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You have to see yourself as belonging to God. No matter what someone calls you, no matter what they try to dress you to adorn you with, to make you mimic or conform to their ways. No matter what they try to do. You belong to God. And when you belong to God, God fights your battles. He does above and beyond what you could ever ask or think of according to the power that worketh. God told Daniel what he was going to do to Nebuchadnezzar. 
and the king was temporarily driven insane, living like an animal for seven years. The king was humbled and he acknowledged the sovereignty of God. And then later God restored his kingdom. Now this is a holy and righteous God that brought judgment against King Nebuchadnezzar. And when King Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged God, then God restored. God is always in the restoration when you restore. And you can't determine who he restores to because this king was a wicked king that got humbled, acknowledged God, and then God restored his kingdom. You can go through things in life and your enemy can keep trying to destroy you. But if you keep your mind stayed on thee, if you keep your will attached to thee, if you keep honoring God despite of the situation, sooner or later, your arm, enemy, your op, your oppressor, your haters is going to know the God that you serve because God's going to humble them. And whether or not he restores back to them will determine on their acceptance of him. See, God is a great God. And Daniel 5 There's a feast and there's a writing on the wall. King Belzar and Nebuchadnezzar descendants, they had a blasphemous feast using sacred vessels from the temple in Jerusalem. Mm. Mm -hmm. They took the temples from Jerusalem when they took them cats and they're using what's sacred unto God for ungodliness. When someone touches what God has given you that was sacred and they begin to use it in an ungodly manner, there's going to be a handwriting on the wall. They were being judged and they were being turned over to the Medes and Persians. That very night, Belkaziah was killed and Babylon fell to King Darius of Persia. Don't get upset. Anybody touching what God gave you, I don't care what it is. I don't care how little it is. I don't care how great it is. If it was dedicated and it belonged to God, consecrated, set aside. If they touched it, and use it for the wrong ungodly purpose, God's going to put a handwriting on the wall. They're going to be destroyed. That's not your choice. It's God's vengeance for taking what was sacred and using it for unsacredness. I don't care if it's a guilt. I don't care if it's money. I don't care what it is. If it's used for unsacredness, if it's used for ungodliness, God will destroy it. Because what God makes sacred, no one makes unsacred. Remember, they couldn't touch the ark. Many died. You don't take nothing from God. You don't play with God. You don't upset authority over God. He's a God of love, mercy, but he's a God of great judgment. And it's called righteous. He will take your life. 
and he doesn't play. He took their life because he knew they would not repent. You see, King Nebuchadnezzar repented at first. He restored his kingdom. And verse four, here in chapter four, here in chapter five, he's going right back into the same foolishness. Blasphemy. Using what is sacred for God. For blasphemous, unholiness, unrighteousness. And God declared, God judged, and turned them over to their enemies' hands. And took away the Babylonian kingdom. He had restored it. They still did not go. They honored for that moment and went right back to their waywardness. See, you don't have to fight a battle when this battle belongs to God. All you have to do is obey the command of the battle. All you have to do is obey the captain. The command, the bishop of your soul, the author and finisher of your faith, your great shepherd, and watch God show those who dishonored them who he is. You don't have to wear it. Is not your position to wear it. Your position is to obey God. Your position is to follow Christ. Your position is to keep your allegiance to him. Don't worry about what God is going to do. He's going to do what he knows needs to be done. Because you don't know the heart and the future. So when God restored King Nebuchadnezzar, he had a chance. But he gave up his chance. Here he is with another king, dishonoring God. After he acknowledged God, God restored him. Now he's dishonoring God. And what God had restored to him, he took away. Now he did this to the king. He also did it to the Israelites in the book of Judges, the writing of Judges. The servitude, they repent, cry out to God. He restores them. They go right back into their sinful way, disobedient way. There's going to come a time when it's over. And it was over for Nebuchadnezzar and King Belzebub, which was Nebuchadnezzar's descendant. It was Nebuchadnezzar's descendant that should have known that because Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged God. Now his descendants is tripping. Using what is sacred. See, you're not responsible for your descendants. You're responsible for yourself. Your descendants have to make the same allegiance to the same God you did. And here, the kingdom had been given to Belsasara. And he died. He could have followed Nebuchadnezzar after Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was restored. And he knew that this is truly the God of creation, the God of death. Sometimes people are going to have to learn who your God is. It's not the sermons that's going to make them know your God. It's not your singing and your preaching that's going to make them know your God. It's not your church attendance that's going to make you them know your God. 
is how you deal with everyday life situations when you put it in God's hands and he begin to work it out on your behalf. They're going to learn who your God is. Let's move to Daniel 6. And Daniel 6, here, after being under a new roof. Now, they don't heard about Nebuchadnezzar. They don't heard about the fiery furnace. They don't heard about Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom being torn apart and then God restores the back. Now, King Belzevar takes over Nebuchadnezzar's God. This is his descendant. And he has a feast and he died. So they don't heard about all that God has done. And in Daniel 6, they have the audacity of the new leadership that God gave them that kingdom. Because God determines who he sets up and who he brings a base. He allowed the Persians to take over. King Darius. That was God's doing. No matter if King Darius thought it was his might. You see, it's not by human ability. It's by God's divine will. That was God's divine will to give it to King Darius. And here he is coming up against one of God's persons. He wants to throw Daniel in the lion's den. After God gave him the kingdom. Sometimes people don't learn. They can hear about all the things that God has done through mouth, even seeing. Then they get in a position and do the same things to dishonor God coming up against God. And they have to learn the same lesson the hard way because they didn't learn from word of mouth. Don't mess with God. He is not to be mocked. Whatever you sow, you shall reap. So what happens? The Persian those Daniel in the lion's den. Jealous officials, they conspired to trap Daniel because Daniel, after going through King Nebuchadnezzar, after going through King Bezabar, and now in the Persian of King Darius' hands, still will not dishonor his God. I don't care how many times administration came you don't change and go with the flow. You stay committed to God. And each administration will have to learn a lesson from God. Here it is now, King Darius. He issued a decree that no one could pray to God or man except the king for 30 days. God says, pray without ceasing. Daniel continued to practice praying to God three times a day. That's the Jewish tradition. He's in captivity, but he's not allowing captivity to conform him. He's going to pray no matter what you law say. You're not God. And definitely you're not going to change and make him bow before your laws that dishonors his God. So here, Dan, you got to go through more. God had to deliver him from the fiery furnace. God had to use him to interpret dreams. And now he got to deal with another rulership. He don't been through three rulerships. King Nebuchadnezzar, God kept him, kept Daniel, fought his battle. King Belzebub, God kept him for his value. Now King Darius, he's put in the lion's den and God shuts the mouth of the lion. Daniel was unharmed. King Darius issues a degree honoring Daniel's God. 
You see what God is doing? God is using Daniel to be a witness for him. Through the trials and tribulations that Daniel is going through that he never went through. By him remaining faithful to God, God is not only blessing and covering him and fighting his battle. Daniel is being used as a light, a reflection of who he belonged to. We are to be a reflection of who we belong to by allowing God to fight our battle. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And Daniel 7 through 12, prophetic visions are given. And in Daniel 9, where I read that scripture, he receives a prophecy concerning the 70 weeks, a timeline leading up to the coming of the Messiah and the final judgment. What God is showing us through the writing of Daniel is God's sovereignty. God's control over history. God's control over kingdoms and rulers. Despite the captivity and trials, Daniel and his friends remained faithful and honored God. Let me say this one more time. Throughout the writing of Daniel, God is showing his sovereignty, his control over history. I don't care what's going on. I don't care who's trying to recreate history. I don't care who's trying to rewrite history. I don't care who's trying to control anything. God controls history, kingdoms, and rulers. Our responsibility is despite of trials and tribulations to remain faithful to God. God is also showing his faithfulness and deliverance. The power of trusting God, even when threatened with death. Now that right there is something to shout about. When someone threatens you, Threaten your livelihood. Threaten all that you have accomplished with God. Ha, la, 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 la. You got to remain powerful and trusting God and allowing God to show who has the power, who has the final say so of the man. Sometimes we just need to be reminded. The next time somebody is foolishness to try to threaten you, you let them know God has this last say so of the matter. And watch God work it out. God will never have you to say something he's not going to fulfill when he says it through you. Ah, la, 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 la. You just don't know when. And lastly, the writing of Daniel shows you that God is omniscient. He knows prophecy. He knows future events. He knows everybody's actions, thoughts, and what will happen. And he has established an eternal kingdom. The writing of Daniel is a foundational text to understand eschatology, the study of the end times, and both Judaism and Christianity. The same God that took care of Daniel and his friends for being faithful is the same Lord and Savior that will take care of you for being faithful. You don't lose nothing for God, but you gain everything. And only an unwise person will touch what God gave and use it unrighteously.
let God be God. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Don't ever change the standards of God for no one and for nothing in this world because God will never change his standard. You don't buy before nothing but God because he's the only true God. And God knows everything you're going to do. He knows how you're going to respond and how he'll get your attention to fulfill what he told you he would do if they do it. Daniel spoke what God told him to speak. And they soon later saw that the God that Daniel served is the true and living God. God proved everybody he puts on the kingship won't follow him. He knew it. He put them there to show. Him. I'll give your enemy your kingdom. And he did. And every time they came up against Daniel, God showed on on Daniel's behalf. Some of you need to trust God for God to show off on your behalf. Some of you too busy trying to show off on your own behalf. God wants to show off on your behalf. You showing off won't accomplish nothing. But when God shows up and shows off, the fear of the Lord is demonstrated and accomplished throughout eternity, wherever he's at. So Daniel said to the Lord, our God belongs his mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Sometimes you get mad and you rebel against the very God that's working on your behalf because you let other people provoke you and irritate you. And you try to work it out on your own way. But God says, no, let me handle it because vengeance belongs to me. So when you understand God's mercy and forgiveness and that you have rebelled against him and God forgives you, then you'll see the hand of God working it out on your behalf. He's always a restore to those who are sincere about being restored. Never let conformity pull you into a road of destruction that there will be no restoration because you trust in flesh and blood and not the divine will of God. You see, Daniel prayed on behalf of Israel. We are to pray on behalf of some of the stuff that's going on. Daniel acknowledged that despite the people's rebellion and sinfulness, their folly and foolishness, God is a merciful and forgiving God. Daniel emphasized that mercy and forgiveness are God's attributes. And he offers these even to those who have turned away from him. The that verse reflects a deeper understanding of God's grace and the hope that he will show compassion even when his people have become disobedient. A wise one will take him and seek God for forgiveness. Let's bring this to closure. And those who continue to rebel against God will find themselves in a strong delusion, a road of prediction and destruction. 
because no one knows God's time. When it's over. And there's nothing you can do about it. His name is wonderful. He's the great shepherd. He's the rock of all ages. The almighty God is he. And we are only to bow down before him. Love and adore him. For his name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. Let us pray. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, we love you, we honor you, we worship you. We thank you for the message. of your sovereignty that you control all kingdoms, all rulers, all powers to be, the future, because you're the often finisher of the creation and everybody's life. Father, we thank you for bringing to remembrance to encourage and strengthen about the reality of how you stood for Daniel because Daniel stood for you. He would not bow. He would not conform. But he remained faithful to you despite of the environment, despite of the laws that threatened to take his life and his livelihood. If ever we need to remember Daniel, we need to remember Daniel's name. The God of Daniel. The God of our God. The God that never fails. Either we're going to be for you or we're going to come into conformity and be against you. Father, I thank you for this message. May it shake the very foundation that has not been laid by Christ Jesus. May it bring light and darkness where conformity has permeated. May it bring a clear understanding, a clear revelation that you are always actively involved and the providential care of creation. Even those that would not acknowledge you. Like you said, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that you know. Thank you, Father, for your spirit of truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.